Good morning and welcome to Easter Sunday worship online. Uh, this is a pre-recorded version of the service that we will be holding at Central this morning. Uh, we've got a busy worship service there. Uh, we are celebrating communion, which obviously we can't do online so easily. Um, we'll be uh, confirming uh, three of our young people and also uh, inducting several of our new elders. And there'll be a brief sermon as well, which I include in this pre-recorded service. He is risen, so I wish you a very happy Easter as we, uh, as we proceed through this uh, coming season. Thank you. And as always, we light our Easter uh, Christ candle. Uh, on Good Friday, we actually put the candle out at the end of the service to uh, reflect the fact that we are in uh, the vicinity and inside the, the dark tomb. Well, now we light it again. And each new day reminds us of the light that dwells within us, the light God has placed deep within our hearts. And so we light our Christ candle remembering that we are made of light and love remembering that we are called to bring light and love to others and to the world. Thanks be to God.
Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel account of St. John of the Resurrection, of course. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb, and she saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and she said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and he believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around, and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Woman, uh, Jesus said to her, Why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not take hold of me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascended to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Thanks be to God for the reading and the hearing of the word. Amen. You know, it's strange that we read these texts every year during Easter, and you would think that as a minister, I would have said everything that can be told about them. Okay, well, granted, I've only been in ministry for four years almost, but Fair enough. But all the same, even though I've preached on these texts several times before, I always find that when I read them again, there's a whole other level that reveals itself. I think that is one of the remarkable things about the Bible. You just keep digging and you keep finding more. I mentioned to you in a previous sermon a couple of weeks ago that I've been reading a book called Resurrecting Easter by John Dominic Crossan. And basically what Crossan and his wife did was they traveled across several countries, uh, Greece, Russia, Romania, Turkey, Italy, and some other countries, all regions where the Eastern Orthodox Church played a big part in these particular societies. And what they discovered was that when it came to paintings and iconography, art, whereas Western Church always portrayed Jesus resurrecting as a solitary figure, as an individual, in the art of these Eastern Orthodox communities, when Jesus rises from the tomb, he's invariably grasping Adam by the hand, and sometimes Eve as well, and lifting them up from the grave. And it emphasizes that in this more ancient tradition than ours, that the resurrection is not so much about the individual, but about a community. Adam and Eve represent the wide community of all of humanity. And there is evidence for this theology in the scriptures of the New Testament. It wasn't just something that the Eastern Church dreamt up. In Matthew 27, for example, we hear <clears throat> that when Jesus was raised, the tombs opened and people who had died came out of their graves and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. And those particular verses, I've always tended to kind of discount, ignore, um, 
do they just seem to be weird and strange in so many ways, almost like a ghost story. It actually reminded me of Michael Jackson's thriller video <clears throat> with all the uh, zombies coming out of their graves. But then I realized quite recently that this text, regardless of whether it's factual or not, is intended to communicate this idea and this theology of a general community resurrection, not only an individual one which is what our Western tradition tends to emphasize. So I've been reading these verses with new eyes recently. In John's account of the resurrection, Mary and the other disciple, as he's called, find that they also need to take a second look before they fully realize that Jesus has risen. After Mary tells Jesus' followers that his body has gone, Peter and the other disciple who is probably John, race each other to the tomb. John gets there first, looks into the grave and sees the linen wrappings, but he doesn't go in. And so he does not realize what has happened. And likewise, Mary sees Jesus, but she thinks he's a gardener. She doesn't recognize him until the moment that he calls her name, Mary. And then she responds joyfully, Rabboni, teacher. So, with resurrection then, there is a need for a second look, or we could say a second set of eyes. This week I went to see Jean and Lake and Lewis, and one of the things I always enjoy about going to their place is the, the stories they tell me of what PEI was like many years ago. And this week Jean was telling me about her grandmother, and she gave me her permission to share this story. She said times were tough for everyone. I think it was back in the 1920s and 1930s. But unlike today, everyone knew who their neighbors were and everybody would look out for each other. And there would be a number of men in these days who, who couldn't find work and they would sort of be wandering from one place to another. And Jean's grandmother would take them in. She would give them a bed for the night, wash and mend their clothes and feed them a meal and they would sometimes do chores around the farm to repair, and then they'd go on their way the next morning. And Jean's grandma wasn't unique in this. It was apparently a uh, fairly common practice on farms to provide this uh, help to people. Well, when I got home, I was thinking about that story, and I realized how much alike that was to these Eastern Orthodox icons of Jesus grasping the hand of humanity in Adam and Eve and lifting them up, that this story was also about community and about someone who in that spirit of Christ was lifting others up, resurrecting them from despair. And Jean's grandmother sort of reaching down and giving people a hand up is something we don't tend to see today in our society. And as a church and as a wider community like Mary and the other disciple, we lose sight of what resurrection really is as we peer into that tomb. We don't see the whole picture of what resurrection is or what it could be for us as a church. And it's why we need a second pair of eyes to show us. And it occurred to me and I was saying to our uh, three young people are being confirmed today, Ella, Carter, and Taylor. Uh, on this, your confirmation day, that in, in the same way that the story Jean told me about her grandmother and revealed to me what resurrection looked like then, back in the past, you know, you have feet which walk further into the future than the rest of us here. And so I guess what I'm saying is... What I was saying to them is during your final confirmation class, I was explaining to them, never hesitate to tell the rest of us what resurrection means to you and what it can mean for this faith community, because you're that second set of eyes which we need so much. Remember, I said to them that as you continue your journey of faith in this community, we, for our part, will do our level best to listen and to look so that we might see the things that you show us. Amen.
And so now we go out in the world. So let us pay attention because there on the horizon before us, what do you notice? It's a new heaven and a new earth. So pay attention. There on the horizon behind us, what do you notice? Well, it's the old heaven and the old earth passing away. So pay attention right here with us, in us, around us. What do you experience? We experience the communion of the Holy Spirit. We experience the peace of God. We experience the love of Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. And have a blessed Easter and see you next time online. Goodbye.